Well, hi, everybody. I've got another buddy book review for you. This is a New Mexico classic called The Enemy Gods by Oliver Lafarge. This was published in 1937 by a uh, New England Yankee who was also, I believe, a Harvard-educated anthropologist, and he spent most of his life in the Four Corners region of New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, among the Navajo Nation. He also married into the Baca family, published a lot of scholarly anthropological articles on this region of the country, on the Navajo Nation, but he also wrote a lot of popular novels. Among them is, you know, this one from 1937, The Enemy Gods. I think he's most famous for his novel, uh, The Laughing Boy, which was published about 10 years before this one, and that won him the Pulitzer. So, uh, I, I knew about him when I was a boy growing up in north, northern New Mexico. I read Laughing Boy many, many years ago when I was very young. And I was intending to read The Enemy Gods as a buddy read-along video with, uh, with Rasmika. Uh, unfortunately, the Postal Service had other ideas. But that's okay because this turned into an all-New Mexico uh, read-along, buddy read-along. So I read this with Chrissy from The Return Shelf and Michelle from the return cart. Wait, I just got those two mixed up. Switch that. I read this with Chrissy from the return cart and Michelle from Challenge Thy Shelf. Well, I may not remember who they are, but you know who they are. So I don't need to tell you how awesome they are. Check them out, even though they'll probably never forgive me for screwing their names up. Anyway, <laughs> um, it was a lot. It was an awesome buddy read along because we shared a lot of emails, shared a lot of ideas, which I'll, I'll go over a couple of them uh, later on in this video. But let me give you my thoughts first. Uh, this was a very interesting book to read, especially in contrast with my previous uh, buddy book review, which was uh, Waiting for the Barbarians by J.M. Coetzee. If you saw that video, you know that I criticized that book quite a bit because it was ostensibly a book about the corrosive influence of a col of a colonial uh, empire uh, and its corrosive influence on a native population. But my critique there was that it was so uh, so cartoonishly dichotomous. You know, it was either black or white, one or the other. There was no sophistication or subtlety in its presentation of colonialism. And because of that, it just turned into a critique of torture, uh, which was ridiculous. <laughs> we don't need a critique of torture. <laughs> and at the time, I was thinking that in, in my review, I said that the uh, Waiting for the Barbarians could really use a more fleshed out approach as far as colonialism, uh, the really difficult questions involved in it. And that's where the enemy gods comes in, because it's just fortuitous that I read this book next, because... This is a much better presentation of the influence of a, co of a colonial empire, that is the United States, uh, going into the Navajo, native Navajo culture of, uh, you know, what is present day known as the Navajo Nation. Um, no book can fully capture, I believe, a, a, all of the, the various nuances of this topic, but I think The Enemy Gods did a acceptable job. This is far from a perfect book, but it presented the influence of colonialism in a way that it was not black and white. There are loads of gray areas, a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of fodder for thought, and that's what made this book a, a very fun read for me and a very fulfilling read. Here's the basic outline. Um, this takes place roughly between 1915 and 1930, something like that. It involves a, a young boy from the Navajo Nation who is assigned the name Myron because he looks like a Myron, for, you know, but he is assigned that name and that's how we know him throughout most of the book. Young Myron is, uh, his father has died. His Navajo father has died. He's got a very bad relationship with his stepfather. So he is, uh, he is uh, shipped off to a government missionary school in northwestern New Mexico. And it's there that he spends uh, probably the next, next 15 years 
uh, the book ends when he's about 20 years old. So between the ages of, let's say, 5 and 20, he is in this government-run missionary school. And the whole book is really this crisis of personality that young Myron is having because he knows he's Navajo, but he feels that his own people in the person of his stepfather has rejected him. And he wants to do what is right in the white culture. That is, he wants to accept the Christian Protestant religion um, and he wants to live as a white man. Uh, because this is the influence he knows. I mean, he went there when he was five years old. And I like, I really appreciate that it's not one of these books where the native population is, you know, the, the noble savage kind of myth. Um, uh, and it's not where the white population is cartoonishly evil either. Um, there's sophistication in this book in all sides. I think Lafarge presents, wants to present both cultures with its good and bad aspects. Uh, even the Navajos themselves admit sometimes where, you know, the uh, white people who are, uh, they're going to take over. It's inevitable. They will. So they send people to the white school as a way to infiltrate, uh, as a way to, one, as a way to infiltrate uh, to maybe uh, use the white man's knowledge to their own advantage or just as a way to survive because they know that the end of their culture is near. They, they do recognize this. But they're not out to, you know, they're not out to have a violent revolution or anything like that. It's more of a, they're trying to live at peace with and trying to acclimate as best as they can. The Navajo are presented uh, as a very uh, agricultural culture, agricultural society. They live in their hogans. They, um, they, they're known by their hoeing. They're always digging furrows and hoeing and weeding constantly <laughs> throughout this book. And they recognize that the, uh, despite their millennia of doing this, you know, the white people bring uh, horticultural knowledge that we can use. They know a lot about growing this stuff too, and we can use that knowledge. So they recognize the, as a matter of fact, now that I think about it, I can't really think of an instance in this novel where uh, the Navajos are really, you know, being hateful towards white people. Now that I, I didn't really think about that before, but now that I think of it, I can't think of an instance where that happens. They're not violent revolutionaries or anything like that. They're trying their best to, uh, to, to acclimate to this white culture the best they can while all of them are just holding on for dear life to their old religions and their old uh, moral codes and their old you know, rituals and things like that. Um, so let's talk about Oliver Lafarge's writing style because all three of us, uh, Chrissy, uh, Michelle, and myself, all of us noticed this, is that Oliver Lafarge is not a natural fiction writer. His fiction really comes across very clunky. It's very, uh, it's non-fluid. And you can tell, I, I can tell, that he is, especially when he's writing about um, the dance and religious ceremonies of the Navajo Nation, you can tell this guy's an anthropologist because when he gets to those sections, he goes into details and minutia that other novelists probably would not do. So like when the Navajos are having their kachina type uh, rituals uh, where they're dancing, he'll write out all of the hymns of the songs in Navajo sometimes with English uh, transcriptions and describe what these hymns mean. Uh, uh, so a lot of novelists wouldn't do that, but that, that comes right from the anthropologist's notebook right there. Uh, but when the uh, characters are presented as, you know, talking to each other or when we want to learn their personalities or anything like that, 
Uh, Oliver Lafarge does not really do a good job with that. He's not good at characterization. He's not good at dialogue. There are some pretty gripping scenes in here with dialogue, in particular one scene where young Myron is uh, being questioned for suspected homosexuality with one of his uh, his um, uh, teachers, which was just a, a cringy, gripping scene. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. But uh, so there are really good scenes like that. But by and large, this book did not do dialogue well. It doesn't do characterization well. As a matter of fact, there are some characters in this book. In particular, there's one young Navajo woman named Juniper who had had a child at some point who was married to an old, old man and had a child by him. Um, we don't learn much about her, but she is a fascinating character that I wish was more fleshed out. I wish Oliver Lafarge would have really fleshed this character of Juniper out. There's another character called, um, I think it's Jerome McKay, something like that. Anyway, he's a Navajo missionary. He's Navajo, but he has fully adopted the white man's ways, the white man's religion. In fact, he has become a, on the, he's on the mission board. I would like to know his story. That's really interesting, but we don't know. We never really get to know these characters in any detail. Uh, so, so that's too bad. Especially early on in this book, I find that the, the language is, or, or the, the, the thoughts of the characters are presented in, in two word phrases, very, very, what Chrissy calls staccato, which I, that was a really good word for it. Very half-baked. I thought that Oliver Lafarge was trying to imitate the way nervous people think, you know, this really fast and scatterbrained style. But it made for very difficult reading. It also switches from first to third to first person really fast. And I thought that Oliver Lafarge was trying to do that. Now, this primarily happens when young Myron is a young boy and he's with the white culture. And there, everybody's scatterbrained because he doesn't know what's going on. He's still confused at this point. It's only when young Myron goes back into the Navajo Nation with his original family that the language becomes more fluid. Oh, he's speaking his own native language now. He can speak with a lot more ease. A big deal is made with names in this novel. So I'm going to read a small portion of this book to you. Uh, this is a part of the book that I found very powerful, somewhere in the middle of this book, where young Myron is given the initial power of knowing his name, his real name, not his assigned name. Um, and the Lafarge holds off till about midway through this book until we learn his name which is kind of a suspense, you know, it's, it's kind of suspense. I noticed early on that we never knew Myron's real name. And it's only through midway we get it because he's holding off as long as he can. So the scene is that young Myron is walking through the desert uh, with, his, uh, with his uncle, shooting star. Myron looked at his uncle's strong face behind the movement of hand and cigarette. Perhaps now something was going to be made clear. Without logical connection, he asked, What is my true name? Myron's uncle suppressed a start of astonishment. He said, It is seeing warrior. Hold to it. Your strength is there. He stared at the fire and roused himself against reluctance to open two great things, possible disapproval of a loved and respected person. What strength, my uncle? We Navajos are beaten. We are few, I think. These old things, well, haven't they failed us already? To his surprise, his uncle smiled. Why shouldn't you think like that? I have, and often. You, with your schooling, you can help me with the answer, I think. Will you have a, will you have a smoke? <laughs> so that's a scene, you know, all through this... Uh, that's a scene where midway through this book, uh, young Myron is really conflicted. White or Navajo? Which way do I go? And I, I like how Myron is, is challenging all of these ideas in his head. Um, this was a good book. It was definitely flawed. It wasn't far from perfect, but it had a lot of really good ideas that made me think. Uh, so 
I am sure that Chrissy and Michelle, if they decide to upload videos on this book, will talk about other aspects that we discussed. But I'll leave it here. So, The Enemy Gods by Oliver Lafarge. This is a beaten and worn copy that I bought at a used bookstore a long time ago. I'm glad I finally got around to reading it.